uh, before I call the roll, this is the last meeting of, uh, I guess, this uh, interim as well as this term of the legislature. Uh, we have some members that uh, have, are not running again, and I just wanted to recognize those members. Of course, Senator uh, Matt Caslin is not uh, not running again. Um, Representative Birch, uh, Tom Birch has been here ever since I came here. Uh, I think he's the dean of the house. He's probably the longest serving member in the history of the General Assembly. And uh, certainly uh, Representative Birch has always represented his constituents very well. So we commend him for that and uh, we uh, honor his uh, service to the General Assembly and the committee as all the other members that I'm gonna mention. Uh, Representative uh, Cantrell, Mackenzie Cantrell is also not running again. Uh, Representative Jim DePlessy. Uh, Representative Norma Kirk McCormick is uh, not, not uh, running. Um, Representative Mary Lou Marzian. Representative Melinda Gibbons Prunty. And I think Representative Attica Scott. So I want to thank all of you for your service, and uh, we certainly will miss uh, having you uh, on this committee. So with that, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Senator Carpenter, Senator Caslin, <laughs> Senator Harper Angel, Senator Schickel, Senator Southworth, Senator Turner, Senator Webb, Senator Westerfield, Senator Wheeler, Here. Representative Blanton, Representative Bowling, Representative Bridges, Here. Representative Birch, Here. Representative Cantrell, Representative Dossett, Representative Dotson, Representative Duplessy, Representative Flannery, Here. Representative Fugate, Here. Representative Johnson, Here. Representative Kirk McCormick, Here. Representative Marzian, Representative Miles, Representative Gibbons Prunty, Representative Scott, Representative Stevenson, Representative Wesley, Here. Representative White, Co-Chair Smith, Present. and Co-Chair Gooch. Present. Okay, we don't have a quorum, so we won't. Uh, we'll dispense with the reading of the minutes. Um, Senator S uh, Smith, or my co-chairman, is here today. Do you have anything you want to uh, say or mention, Senator? No. Okay. All right. With that, we uh, we we really have kind of a short agenda today. Um, we're going to have a discussion on issues related to the Public Service Commission, specifically an explanation of. Uh, Legislation, I, I'm not sure there is any legislation yet, but there have been some uh, talk about uh, securitization of uh, utility regulator, regulatory assets and then energy price volatility and its impact on the utility customer's cost. And uh, with that, I will introduce uh, uh, with from the Public Service Commission, uh, Kent Chandler who is the chairman, and Kent, we welcome you here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Gooch. I appreciate it. So um, I just want, first want to apologize. I, I certainly didn't provide this uh, this presentation with much much advance. Um, I, uh, I You all asked me last week, and I've, I've thrown something together. I don't want to indicate that throwing something together is any disrespect to the committee, but uh, on short notice, these are uh, at least the initial part of the presentation, so some pretty complicated uh, uh, subject matter. So um, this is, I think, maybe the fourth time I've presented to either the uh, IJC or either the House or the Senate um, uh, committees. And so I'm going to, uh, again, give our just our quick background, because most of you all have heard it a handful of times this year, uh, and then get to the meat of the situation. So uh, initially, I just want to say, um, again, my name is Kent Chandler. I'm chairman of the Kentucky Public Service Commission been a commissioner for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I worked at the commission. I was a consumer advocate uh, in the attorney general's office practicing in front of the commission. Um, importantly, I can only speak for myself. Uh, nothing I say today is should be taken on behalf of the Public Service Commission. The commission can only speak through its administrative orders. Uh, and I certainly, uh, what I say today doesn't reflect upon the other public service commissioner. Um, so uh, the Public Service Commission is an independent regulatory agency that's connected to the Energy and Environment Cabinet for administrative purposes only. Uh, it's a three-seat commission that carries out the legislative function of rate making, 
uh, through quasi-judicial um, <laughs> quasi-judicial proceedings. So if that's not a, a mouthful, I don't know what is. So we technically have uh, more than a thousand utilities that we regulate. The majority of those are utilities in name only. Uh, they are uh, entities that we don't actively regulate, such as um, uh, certain certain telecommunications providers. We actively regulate the way I would. Uh, that's my description. It's not a technical term. About 200 utilities. Those utilities provide water, sewer, gas, uh, electric, and telephonic services. Uh, we've got uh, investor-owned and cooperative, uh, member-owned cooperative electric utilities. We regulate uh, rural water districts, rural water associations, investor-owned water utilities, um, and uh, natural gas distribution systems. Two things to point out to everybody I think the, that are important for these conversations is we, we don't regulate muni municipal utilities at all. Uh, if it's a city-owned utility or a city-affiliated city utility, we don't regulate them, except that we do regulate the safety of their natural gas distribution systems if they have them. Uh, we also do not regulate the rates or service of electric cooperatives that receive their power from the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, the, they, they, that's something about the supremacy clause. They look down on us trying to tell them what to do. So the Public Service Commission was created by the General Assembly in uh, the 1930s. Um, everything we do, uh, for the most part, at least with regards to utilities, relates to rates and service. The statute says that rates have to be fair, just, and reasonable, and that the utility has to provide service that is adequate, efficient, and reasonable. So um, in talking about this idea of, of what's called securitization, um, I felt it was probably, it's probably impossible to understand in a 30-minute presentation. It's taken me probably about two and a half years to have an appreciation for the complications. But it is uh, certainly impossible if you don't have an appreciation for how the commission regulates utilities rates. So quickly, I'll just do some background uh, and talk about the, the parts of rate making that are relevant to this idea of what's called securitization. Um, hopefully, I can give an example of, uh, of how it w can work in other states that have this. Um, and then I'll stop and pause uh, for questions, but I'll certainly take any questions throughout um, the, the proceeding. So utilities in Kentucky are not competitive businesses. Instead, uh, the General Assembly says that their rates and service need to be regulated by a state entity, the Public Service Commission. So the reason for that, or at least the uh, initial concern for that, was around the, uh, around the risk of uh, wasteful duplication of the same types of investment and service. So you all have probably seen pictures of the cities in the early 1900s where you had telephone and electric poles that had 100 different wires of all these different competitors running across it, right? The concern was that that was not a particularly efficient use of capital. So specifically for electric utilities, the General Assembly uh, has provided all electric utilities defined service territories. So municipalities, electric co-ops, investor-owned utilities have defined service territories down to the foot. If they are the only entities allowed to provide electric service to anybody that's an electric consumer in that territory, and there is no competition. With that, though, they have an obligation to serve every single entity that W demand service in that service territory. So whether it's a home, whether it's a factory, whatever it is, if you are located smack dab in the middle of that service territory, that utility, as long as you follow their commission approved rules, they have to provide you electric service at defined rates. But a, a great, a state granted monopoly, which is exactly what the defined service territories are, creates two primary problems. The first is that once uh, an entity gets a monopoly, that they're going to provide really terrible service to people. The second is that the monopoly, as we all know about monopolies, would like to have profits that are well in excess of the cost that they incur. So the solution to those issues is to regulate the utilities' rates and service. So again, and I'm going to say this two or three times, but rate regulation of monopolies, especially investor-owned monopolies, is a function of costs. So in the ideal, I'm going to take a big step back and talk about economics for about 10 seconds. So in an ideal version of, of competition, and in particular, a quote, perfect market, short run prices will reflect or should reflect the marginal cost of a particular product. The introduction of monopolies leads to an exception that the firm will charge prices or an expectation, sorry, uh, monopolies, the concern is that they're going to charge prices in excess of their costs, leading to a sale of less goods, since things are more expensive than they ought to be, and resulting in what's called deadweight loss. 
So this goes back to, this is primarily economics from the early 1900, a concern around, um, well, I just say the, this thing called the marginal revolution, it's kind of been disproved since, but this idea of when supply meets demand, there's a perfect price, right? So under a scenario of having monopoly prices, the producer makes more, has more surplus than they would have originally under a competitive system. The consumer has less surplus than they would have under a competitive uh, scenario. But there's also this amount of, quote, surplus that accrues to neither the producer or the consumer, right? So although the producer's better off, everyone, all of the world would have been better off had there been competition, right? And what doesn't get realized is called deadweight loss. And so just here's just a, a little map. Uh, where Can't, peace and I yeah. interrupt. I think Senator oh. Wheeler may have a question oh, no, I was later. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's, right. he's getting in early. Yes, he yeah, is. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> he's, at, he's outside of the theme park waiting, waiting for the gates That's to open. So, uh, just quickly, in, in a competitive market, uh, is where uh, PC, uh, the competitive price, uh, meets QC, the competitive quantity, right? The amount of quantity that would be purchased. Uh, in a competitive market. So M, QM, and PM are, are the result of a monopoly. So the price is higher and the quantity that was sold is less. The yellow there is dead weight loss. We are all worse off if a monopoly is able to charge prices in excess of the uh, of the perfect uh, price or the competitive price. So this is this is mostly theory, but it, it, it is the primary concern with uh, non-regulated monopolies. So with that, again, going back to costs, since we have concerns about the prices that a monopoly would charge, particularly charging rates in excess of their own costs, rates are, are created by public utility commissions based on the cost incurred or the expected cost to be incurred by a utility. So when we have rate cases that are filed with us, the very first thing you do in rate making is to determine all of the cost of a utility that they've either incurred, if you're looking backwards, or expect them to incur in a particular year that you think, and I'm saying the fictional public utility commissioner should think, that a utility should incur, right? So if the utility paid every, all of their executives an extra million dollar bonus, that's a cost they incurred. But a regulator may not think that that's a cost that the utility should be able to recover from customers. So all of these different costs are taken into account. And these costs can include operations and maintenance expenses, uh, investments that the utility has made, and also includes a return on the capital that those investments uh, are underpinned or underpinned by. So here's a, a just how we create what's called the revenue requirement. The revenue requirement is the determination of the utility's annual expenses that the Public Utilities Commission says should be recovered from customers. And it's calculated as follows. You take all the operations and maintenance ex expenses, which some of uh, kind of makes sense as repairs, depreciation expense on assets, labor costs, salaries, fuel, insurance, taxes, uh, I already said taxes, uh, taxes always feel like twice, so I'll just say it twice. Um, you take all those operations and maintenance expenses, and then you add it to this other number. And the other number is a return on your investment, a return on your net investment. And that's calculated as being your original investment, reduced by the amount of that investment you've already recovered, times a rate of return. So the rate of return, and this is where we're getting down to brass tacks when it comes to securitization. The rate of return that is used to calculate a utility's rates is the cost of debt and the cost of equity capital that underpins their investment. Now, this is the part of this that I'll stop and make very clear that when I'm talking about all of this, this is the calculation and the beginning step for regulating investor-owned utilities. This is not the calculation used to determine the revenue requirement or to make rates for member-owned electric cooperatives. And the reason for that is they're not investor-owned. So the return on investments is not the primary reason or not uh, a primary calculation for setting their rates. Their rates are set differently. And their rates are just about being able to repay their lenders and having a little bit of cushion left over in case things don't go right. That's the simplest way I can describe how you set rates for electric co-ops. So here's an example of what that rate of return, and that's the rate of return and the level of investment is all that securitization deals with, with utilities. So the rate of return in that, in that uh, calculation is the cost and the type 
of capital that was used to fund the utilities investment. Now, we all have an experience that debt capital, borrowing money as, as debt, is less expensive than equity capital because of the rights and the risks that come with each type of capital. Lenders in bankruptcy always get the first uh, swipe at whatever's left over, right? Um, after that, equity investors get whatever is the remainder at the very end of the day. So equity investors have a higher risk of a return on their investment than debt and uh, debt holders and lenders do. So if a utilities investments were funded by both debt and equity, and this is, this is fairly uh, representative, it's about half for most utilities. Half their uh, investments are funded by debt and the other half is funded by equity. So if you're able to borrow money at 4% and you're able to get money from investors at about a 10% cost of equity, your cost of capital on an average basis is 7%. Half your cost is at 4% and half is at, at 10%. If you had originally invested in your utility $100 and you've already over the last few years recovered half of that, $50, when you're calculating your rates as a utility in this year, that 7% is uh, calculated based off of your current net investment, which is the remaining $50. And so your return is $3.50. Now, $3.50 in this, uh, in this uh, you know, scenario is not the utility's profit. $3.50 is the rate of return. Part of that rate of return is the amount that you have to pay back each year to your lenders. That's a dollar. So that is the half of the $50, the remaining uh, split, uh, $50 is split 25-25 debt and equity. And of that $25, your debt rate was 4%, which is a dollar. So $2.50 that year is the utility's return on equity, right? That's the amount of profit that the utility made for shareholders in this uh, given scenario. So <clears throat> it should be clear by now if I did any did my job at all to this point in the presentation, utilities make more profit the more they invest, right? That is, that's what the whole scheme is set up to do, right? The idea was that legislatures decided that electricity and water and gas is good. We want our people to have it. And how do we get private capital to go out and put steel in the ground and pipes in the ground to provide those services to people? They, the legislatures decided to incent investment in those services, right? So the more steel in the ground, the more investment a utility makes, and you apply the exact same amount of return, the more money that utility makes, right? So- Ken, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Along those lines, um, does the Public Service Commission limit what a particular utility may invest and if you do, is that because you're concerned that, that if they're investing more, the rate is passed on to the consumer? So the, the answer to the first question is the, the in, in rate making, the Public Service Commission explicitly sets the amount of investment that should be recovered. So the answer is yes. Um, now, uh, just a nuance to that answer, the PSC tells you how much you can recover from customers, not how much you can invest. So if you decide to go off uh, hog wild, I guess I'd say, and spend a, invest a bunch of money that you that the, maybe the commission had previously told you not to invest, the utility runs the risk of not recovering that from customers. Uh, but the answer, I guess, th the direct answer to your question is, is yes. The commission, in figuring out what the rates ought to be, sets the amount of investment that should be recovered from customers. So that, and then the answer to the second answer why it's really fact specific to the reason why there's probably dozens of reasons in a particular situation why the utility might uh why the commission might not might try to limit or inhibit the amount that customers recover or that the utility invests and i would say that my experience has been that one of those reasons is a concern for the impact on rates if the utility invests too much money because again if it's recoverable from customers it's going to show up in that bill so in your experience you think generally uh, utilities um, will probably not invest more money than what they're allowed to recover on. I, I would, I'll, I, I'll say this differently. I would say that in any situation where you're rate regulated like this, that um, you would most likely invest money that you believe to be recoverable. Um, and, and so that goes back to one of our, our primary statutes. It's the, 
uh, it's originally the second uh, section in, in chapter 278, the section we operate under it. And it basically says before a utility can build something, it has to come to the Public Service Commission to get a certificate that that uh, expansion or that building is necessary, right? Um, and that was a way of getting basically pre-approval. I'm oversimplifying it, and that's not technically legally correct. But it, it basically getting pre-approval before the utility goes out and spends a bunch of uh, money and invests a bunch of money, they would come to the commission and make sure that that investment is needed. And that does two things. One, it makes sure that the utility uh, is that the commission is making sure that the utility is making the right kind of investments. But it also protects the utility to a certain degree because they've already had the commission pass judgment on their proposal that that investment was needed. So that really reduces the risk that in the long term, the commission won't deny recovery of those investments. Okay. So, but now in some cases you're talking about if that utility is trying to expand, but another situation may be that that utility is wanting to upgrade like existing infrastructure, mm -hmm. whether it be pipelines or, you know, utility, the grid or whatever, uh, but it will still be the same. You're, 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 you, in some instance, limit how much investments a utility can make per year in a, in, in, in their service area. That's right. That's right. And I, I think that, um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm racking my brain for an order in the last two and a half years where we've said something e explicit around that. Uh, but at least in the last five or six years, there have been orders where the commission said, look, we think you're making investments way too fast. We're worried about the cumulative impact on customers of those investments. And we would like to limit the amount of investment you make to X amount of, of dollars. Um, uh, the utility at any given time is uh, every time they file a rate case, they're certainly um, they have a right. in every one of those cases that to, to ask to say, look, we have a need for and I'm just making up numbers. The commission said you can only spend $10 million on this per year because we're worried that spending 15 or 20 might be too much. If the utility comes back in every single rate case, they can say, we want it to be 12 next year. We want it to be 20. Next, you know, we need it to be X because we have all these needs and not letting us do that results in Y. Um, the reality of rate making is that a utility can file an application to do something each and every single day after the utility, after the commission has denied it, right? There's nothing is ever permanent in terms of the commission's denial. The utility always has a right to come back and ask to do something different. So the utility, uh, just because I don't want to miss something, the utility makes profit on the more they- Mr. Smith may have oh. a question. Yeah, just briefly. Um, so they, they, so the utility can ask for a raise, but they can also apply for through increases also through different uh, federal agencies, right? Isn't that another appeal for them to go around <clears throat> maybe ask for increased pass-through costs through like FERC or MISO or- yeah. So it would depend on what the type of cost is. So- um, at least well, I say with gas utilities, that may not necessarily be the case, at least not with the um, facilities that are jurisdictional to us. Uh, but with electric utilities, there are far more of their costs or their facilities that are um, in which federal agencies also have concurrent jurisdiction. Um, and the reality is that uh, we can't reprice a federal determination of rates. So if um, <clears throat> if a how do I say this? If a if FERC, for instance, says a transmission expense is X, uh, the their transmission rate is X, we can't that that utility incurs that cost, and there's nothing that we can do about that. The only thing we can do is not let them pass that cost on to customers. <laughs> a utility can only incur so many costs that don't get passed on to customers until there starts becoming a problem of them being able to run that utility. Um, if utility is incurring costs every single year and recovering none of it from customers, for instance, the extreme, uh, the utility is not going to be able to provide service. Thank you. I, I know it's much more of a complex no. question long term, but just for that purpose. Yeah, and I appreciate the question because I'm actually going to touch on that in the second half of, of the amount and increasing number of costs that are passed through to customers in which they were set in motion in, in such a way that we can't do anything about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kurt, Representative Kurt McCormick, did you have a question? Um, you know, I come from Martin County, and I represent the constituents there, and we've had a long, long problem with our water. Can you give me a brief status of what is going on with the water? I can. Can I do it at the very end of, of, of the presentation? You can. Okay. And, and a second question I have is uh, our base, base rate, this is without sewage, is now $50. 
a month for base rate. How many how many gallon of water is permitted uh, or is covered under that base rate? I don't I don't have that in front of me. Like I said, we we've got 150 water utilities. I, I don't I I don't remember the the rates for for the base rate at least for Martin County. Or I guess I know about the rate, but I don't know <clears throat> every utility is different in the amount that you. I don't know. <clears throat> this is my characterization that you get free with that base rate. Some utilities give a thousand gallons included some up to 4,000 gallons. And then some just have like a customer charge and then you pay for every thousand gallon yes. over that. So I, I don't know the exact Can you rate. you give me that there. number because mm -hmm. uh, I have so many people that are struggling with their utility bill, with their water. Um, <clears throat> our water's off half the time. It was off yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's just one break after another. Yep. And, uh, you know, I've hustled and, and lobbied for money down here for our water. And I know that we've gotten millions of dollars <clears throat> to put into our water system. And uh, we're still continuing to have large price increases. And we're still having to be without water for, you yep. know, sometimes as much as 24 hours, sometimes as much as two and three days. So... Um, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and let's maybe we can limit those really <clears throat> very specific per utility questions to contact with you later or something. Yeah. This is this is all I do every day. So okay. please, you, you, any other questions? Uh, any question? Uh, I'll, I'll be here all day, and then I'll, I'll I'll be here for the next year and a half. So, um, so the the assuming you make the exact same amount per dollar invested, right? The more you invest, the more money you make. So the PSC determines that cost of equity capital in each case. And then when doing, figuring out what investors need, it's not like debt where you've got a document that says what the lender requires uh, as the debt cost. Equity is, is much more, uh, it's much harder to determine what investors are demanding to be paid on their investments. So in every case, the Public Service Commission figures out what that rate of return for equity investments are. Um, and we do that, and this is simplifying the, one of the most complicated things we do in half a sentence, but that we just figure out what your return ought to be commensurate with the risk that that investor is taking. <clears throat> so uh, that's the preface for securitization. So uh, the top line is the uh, a very legalese way of saying what securitization is. But the simplest way is in the first bullet, the second bullet point there, that securitization is a process that would be set out by statute so that customers of a utility can effectively buy an asset from the utility using money provided by bonds financed by lenders. So effectively, since the utility earns an equity investment or an equity return and a debt return on their own investments, replacing that investment with a only using only debt capital reduces the financing cost of that equity. So the best way to think about this is that <clears throat> you're not reducing the principal of the loan, but you're effectively refinancing it. And you're refinancing it, and it's not necessarily in the utility's name. It's certainly, I'll get to a second, it's not in the state's name. It is backed by captive ratepayers. So sometimes these bonds that are used to buy out the utility investments are referred to uh, at, colloquially as ratepayer backed bonds because they're financed on the premise that a utility's customers, pursuant to a statute, have guaranteed the repayment of the bond according to predetermined rates and schedules. So here's a scenario, and I picked a fairly extreme scenario in the sense of the numbers um, make the decision obvious. Uh, but uh, regretfully, this is something that uh, plenty of states have dealt with, and, and at least to a certain degree, um, the folks in, in the eastern part of the state, will this will sound halfway familiar. So the scenario is a utility has a power plant that has $200 million left of investment on it that the utility has yet recovered. Recent federal environmental laws require that that generator, that power plant, either upgrade the power plant to come into compliance with a new law, or it retire by 2028. So the utility figures out, they ask, uh, uh, you know, contractors and, and ask folks what it's going to cost. And they figure out they do RFPs and they figure out that in order to comply with the law, that $200 million power plant is going to have to be in, ha have to have investments made to it to get it in compliance. And that those investments are going to cost an extra $500 million. However, replacing, retiring and replacing that generator with another generator or group of generators would cost $175 million. 
And the assumption for this scenario is that the replacement generator would last exactly as long and be the cost of which would be recovered over the exact same life as what that new generator would run after it gets uh, reinvested. So the utility sits down, talks to their accountants and says, it is the least cost, most reasonable thing for customers to retire this current generator instead of investing an extra 500 million in it, and instead replace it with a generator that costs $175 million. So the utility comes to the Public Service Commission in that state and says, we want to build this new generator as the least cost, most reasonable option, given that we now have a need for generation since we need to retire this other old costly generator. At the same time, the utility requests PSC approval for the deferral and subsequent recovery of the remaining value of the retiring power plant as a, quote, regulatory asset. So you all, I'm sure you all heard Chairman Gooch say regulatory asset at the beginning of this. Uh, for anybody in here that pays a bill to Kentucky Power, uh, what used to be the Big Sandy Retirement Rider, which is now, the, I think, the Big Sandy Decommissioning Rider, is a regulatory asset. So a regulatory asset is a paper asset that reflects a cost that otherwise would have to have been incurred in a single year, like an ordinary expense. But it's treated like an asset, and instead it's recovered over a number of years. Generally, since it's a long-term investment and ties up capital, regulatory assets earns a return like other investments, including a return on the equity capital portion. <clears throat> so this extreme scenario, deferral accounting would make sense. And I'm not prejudging anything. I'm just saying the numbers are extreme. Without the ability to create that regulatory asset, accounting rules would require the utility in this scenario to expense that $200 million in the year that it retires. No one in their right mind that runs a utility is going to just step up and agree to take a $200 million hit if they don't have to in a given year. That $200 million is... It, just imagine incurring a $200 million expense in a given year and see what phone calls you get from investors, right? From shareholders. So the retirement and replacement of the generator is an economically is economically better for customers because one of them is going to cost $500 million, The other one is going to cost $175 million. If the utility did not expect to get deferral accounting for that $200 million and instead knew they would have to eat that $200 million, they wouldn't do it. And that would be terrible for customers because they would keep running that $200 million plant and come to the Public Utilities Commission and propose the $500 million upgrade. So customers are going to be paying $500 million instead of the $175 for the alternative, plus a profit on that extra $325 million. So assuming that the PSC agrees that the replacement generator is the least cost best option to serve customers, here's where the scenario stands. The old power plant gets retired. The value of the old plant is $200 million. The new generator costs $175 million. And the utility earns a return and charges customers a return on that $375 million if it didn't retire and seek a reg asset. So here's where securitization comes in. Securitization provides an opportunity for customers to replace the $200 million of the utility's investment in that regulatory asset with $200 million financed by rate payer backed bonds. Customers pay, customers buy out that regulatory asset. So here's the benefit. This is where we get to uh, how, it, how it seeks. And I don't have slides on this part, but the benefit is that through securitization, which I'll explain the process here in a second, that $200 million that represents a regulatory asset, a paper asset, for, an, for a power plant that's now on the ground and retired, that if it's stuck with a utility under that uh, the, the, what I was talking about earlier, it would earn a 7% return for the utility each year. If customers, if securitization occurred, and customers through rate payer backed bonds effectively were on the hook for that $200 million and sent a $200 million check to the utility, then the cost to customers, the financing costs would only be 4% if it was debt only. Therein lies the benefit that some states have determined is derived from securitization, that you effectively refinance regulatory assets for assets that are no longer in productive service. 
So the process, and I'm gonna move quickly here because you all have these slides, you can look back at it. But the process would be that the utility comes to the, and this is in other states that have this, um, a utility comes to the Public Utilities Commission and says, we want to do securitization for this regulatory asset that we have. Um, we want to go out and find bondholders who will lend the money to customers. And here are the costs and charges that we're going to charge customers in order to make sure that the bondholders get repaid. And the utility isn't, those aren't the utilities dollars. The utility is just, they just so happen to have captive customers who pay bills. And so the utility be, will be recovering that cost on behalf of lenders. So the application would include uh, what the costs that are represented by the regulatory asset are. So a retired power plant that's now you know, on the ground is hopefully some, something else could be put there for goodness sakes. Uh, a testimony describing what the proposal would be, uh, what the transaction would look like, what the customer impact would be, what the expected savings would be what the cost of financing would be. What is that debt rate? Do you expect it to be 3%, 4%, 5%? And what what is your proposal to ensure that those costs are non-bypassable so that customers have to pay them every month? Because that's why you get such a low cost of debt for these, for these charges. Um, I'll talk about it in a second, but securitization bonds up to this point, uh, there have been $62 billion across the United States of securitization bonds issued by utilities. Almost every single one of those gets triple A uh, ratings on those bonds. And the reason is because bondholders feel very sure that they are going to be repaid their costs. And the reason for that is because of how strict the statutes are and how sure they are that those co that customers aren't going to get out of those paying those costs. So the PSC would review and other states review the application to make sure that in totality, the proposal is good for customers. That would probably look like a net present value uh, benefit to customers over whether it's 10 or 20 years um, as compared to what would happen uh, but for the securitization. Make sure that the securitization doesn't unnecessarily impair the health of the utility. Um, there is a um, uh, some credit rating agencies are um, more reasonable than others. Uh, some perceive this to be debt for the utility, even though the utility doesn't hold the debt. Some don't, um, but certainly... Uh, that's something to take into account because you don't want to make the utility so worse off that customers are in totality worse off than they would be if they didn't securitize this. Uh, and then some states allow for the Public Utilities Commission, since this is what they don't, they don't do this every day, uh, to employ either financial or legal professionals. So uh, the PSC would look at whether it's a net benefit, uh, whether customers are going to pay the bond uh, until it's, it's fully paid off, um, and what the result of, uh, of the securitization would look like. So why do you securitize? Well, I've talked about most of it. You replace high, high cost, uh, high cost utility investment with low cost debt. Um, utilities make investment in assets in order to provide services. They're not financing entities, right? Uh, so this is a way to make sure that they get their money back so that they can then take that money once something is securitized and reinvest it into the assets that are needed to provide service. So a great example of this in most states that have used this for retired generators, the utility will take that money that was securitized after they get that check and they'll go and invest in the replacement generation. So about half the states have securitization legislation. Some are more broad than others. Some are very particular about what can and can't be securitized. Um, a couple of things, a couple of, of items that are allowed to be securitized or have been securitized in the past are retired generation, uh, a couple of Midwest states who had, um, during winter storm URI, their utilities incurred billions, and I'm billions with a B, billions of dollars in gas costs over just a couple of days period, when otherwise they would have just incurred merely one, two, three, four million dollars. It was some in some instances, 100 or 200 times more than what they were used to paying. Uh, some of those utilities were allowed to securitize those and try to reduce that cost to customers. Uh, some of the folks in the western uh, part of the U.S. have used taken wildfire costs and securitized those. Um, and then uh, especially some of the, the states that are in the Gulf or on the Atlantic coast have used securitization to reduce the cost of extreme storm damage. Uh, the debt is not backed by the full faith and the credit of the state. Uh, they are instead obligations of captive ratepayers, not even of the utility. So again, as of May of this year, $62 billion of utility securitization bonds have been issued by electric utilities. So why do you need a statute? You need a statute to make sure that there's enough protections for lenders so that they give you the absolute cheapest rate. That's, 
I'm, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. You've got the slide, but that's the idea is you need the protection uh, that the legislature gives you um, to ensure lenders, to ensure that customers pay the absolute lowest rate. So um, I, I'd like to stop there if I could, um, Chairman. I just have a couple of slides on the utility rate issues, the fuel adjustment clause and the volatility. But if you want me to keep going, I can. But if there are questions about securitization, it's a good place. So let's do that at this time. Um, Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So many questions, so little time. Um, going back to your scenario, this this scenario that you presented, is that the typical scenario that, that causes the securitization need? I, I, I hate to say something that's typical, but I would say that... Um, we, Predominantly. We, let me say it this way. We don't get hit by wildfires, and we don't necessarily have hurricane issues. And so I, I'd say it's the most likely to occur in the state of Kentucky. I'll say it that way. So the scenario really um, generates a need for an early retirement of a power plant. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, I, I generally I would say yes. I, I do. I think I perceive the idea of early, re, early retirement. Um, maybe I would take issue with that only because – I'll say it this way: yeah, retirement ear earlier than initially anticipated. I think that's fair enough to say. So it's early. So it, it's before you the. You can put as many prepositional phrases in there if you want. It's being retired early. It well, so it's being retired prior to the entire value of the of the of the asset being retired uh, of the asset being recovered. So the the reason I, I take issue with the idea of early is utilities in, through integrated resource plans, for instance, with the commission. Uh, on a triennial basis, always look at what the value and the benefit and the cost of their current generators are for, and, and the way to serve customers in the cheapest manner. And that calculation can be simply determined by what is the cost of, is the cost of doing something different more expensive or less expensive than the cost of the status quo? And so if the cost of the stay open cost of current generators has somehow gotten very, very expensive and the cost of replacement generation has gotten very, very cheap. I hate to say early because you want to look at that on an annual, biannual or triannual basis to say, does it make sense to keep doing what we're doing or is it cheaper to do something different? So I, I, that, that's the only reason I take issue with the, the term early, but I, I take your point that it's prior to the asset being fully depreciated. And what in this scenario generates the need to retire the plan and do something different is in fact environmental requirements in in this yeah in this fictional scenario that's right <clears throat> so would it be fair to say that if we didn't change the rules on this power plant with new environmental requirements we wouldn't even need to have this conversation uh this particular scenario sure well this is the scenario we seem to be seeing time and time again so i think it's fair to to specify this scenario yeah okay um so moving on from that, when you talk about the necessary replacement generation, your definition in there says the replacement generation would have the same operating cost and I would think the same reliability. Is there such an animal that is, as, has the same operating cost and the same reliability as a coal-fired coal power plant? Yeah, and I, I want to make clear, I didn't, I don't think I said that the power plant was coal fired. I, I just was making a, you know, simplifying assumption. But but the reality is that no two things are exactly the same when it comes to power plants. Uh, gas and thermal generation generally looks very similar. Uh, coal, gas, natural, ga uh, coal, natural gas and, and nuclear, but certainly the characteristics, their operating characteristics and the reliability are, are, are different. So we d we really aren't talking apples to apples in most cases. I don't, I I would say that if you're talking about a retiring coal generator and replacing it with a coal generator, you're not talking apples to apples. The The efficiency of those two units are going to be materially different. Well, it, it, it's just that one of the assumptions is that you get the same service with the new technology. Right. I'm not sure that's actually realistic in most cases. So we have to be very careful, I think, if we're going to try to do something like this part of the, the the calculation has to be what are we doing to the customer's service and uh, I'm not sure we've answered that today and maybe we need lots more conversations about it but uh, we, we've got to take that into consideration 
and it, no, I appreciate that. And I'm happy to have that uh, conversation. I think that was part of my presentation uh, the end of last year. Happy to talk about it, continuing about uh, how our options for replacement generation are fairly narrow, um, and uh, and that's a particular problem, and it has to be taken into account when you're doing resource planning. Which, to reemphasize, is all being generated and required by ever-changing environmental rules, in my opinion. One last question, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, bottom line... Does this process increase for co-ops their costs? So I, I don't, I, again, I'm, I speak only for myself. I don't think it makes sense for co-ops. And here, here's why. Um, because the, the trade-off you're talking about that creates savings, when I was talking about savings earlier, is the replacement of a capital return with a debt return. But co-ops exclusively use debt equity to find, or debt capital to finance all of their investments. So it, it, how do I say this? Um, you, that that's as much about replacing some replacing something that costs exactly the same amount and going through a whole process to do it. it there would be no savings there for an electric cooperative. All right, I think uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your indulgence. I have others, but I'll pass. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, let, let me say I think uh, the commissioner and I have talked about this. Uh, uh, you know, privatization certainly is something that might work in a situation like in East Kentucky with the Big Sandy that had already been closed. People were already having to pay those stranded costs in their utility bills, uh, and we were looking for some ways to maybe lower those costs. Uh, there's no way that I would uh, uh, be working on an, a bill that would in some way incentivize closing a baseload uh, power generation from coal or anything else that was 85%, 90% efficient yep. I just wouldn't do that and so that's not the intent as to what we're trying to do here um, and if I if I could on yeah. that just that's why I made it such an extreme <laughs> extreme because I wanted to I wanted to get straight into what securitization actually is and how how it impacts it but um, I, I would I would say very very directly those are not the type of decisions that are in front of us nothing is that cut and yeah, dry. I wouldn't hold you accountable to the yeah. numbers, yeah. just the That's, process. Yeah. Oh, I understand. Those, they, those are probably happening in other states where people are actually promoting privatization uh, to close, uh, uh, you know, existing coal or whatever and replace them with things that are much less reliable. Uh, Senator Wheeler, I think I almost forgot. <laughs> That's fine, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, uh, so, uh, Representative Johnson uh, hit on a few things I was going to discuss in the sense that um, – uh, first, I know Kent, we, we had several discussions about uh, securitization in the past, and um, I would agree that uh, I think in Kentucky none of us wants to, to do any type of legislation that would uh, promote the acceleration of any closure of uh, coal-fired plants within the Commonwealth. Uh, coming from a coal-producing region, I know I would not. Um, but a, a few questions for me, Mr. Chairman. I guess first, and I think you touched upon this in your presentation, if the um, if the utilities were to close the asset or, or, or to decide that the um, particular asset upgrading it to meet environmental concerns was in the benefit of the rate players, uh, there's still going to be new costs in the form of, uh, I guess, and most likely, I guess, from what Washington would be uh, mandating renewables uh, that will be passed upon uh, passed on to the the rate payers, correct? Yeah, it would be likely at this point that with with a couple of exceptions, and I, I, I think one of our utilities could probably retire one of their generators and not necessarily need to replace it. But as a general matter, we, we, look, we frown upon our utilities having so much generation that they could retire one without needing to replace it with something. So most of them are tight enough with capacity that it would necessitate some sort of replacement. Okay. And... And th there's probably an indirect cost passed on to consumers as well, as well, because a lot of these renewable sources are actually being subsidized by the federal government. I mean, they, you know, if you compare apples to apples, usually, um, you know, the renewable resources aren't quite as efficient from a production capacity as traditional fossil fuels, correct? Uh, it, they, have, they have very different operating characteristics. That's exactly right. And, and a lot of renewables is based upon subsidizing from the federal government, is it not, or subsidies? Um, yeah, I, yes. I think that I think it's pretty clear they either get production tax credits or investment tax credits. But uh, I, I just 
as an aside, I do think there are other resources that that get. It is not a particularly level playing field, depending on what Congress passes in any given year. That's right. I, I, I yeah, it's you. there's there is it is very hard to do an apples to apples comparison sure. when when it comes to our job. But in a sense, right. the renewables are getting uh, they're getting paid for by the taxpayer as well in an indirect sense. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, and I guess the cost of replacing facilities at this point with the increased prices in steel and concrete and things like that, uh, that would probably be more expensive at this point in time, given the inflationary pressures on the market, would it not? Uh, it, it, honest to goodness, it would depend on the particular situation. Um, I mean, there are some generators that it, it is there are some generators that if they were forced to make certain investments in order to stay compliant with environmental requirements, that it would be much cheaper to retire and replace it with, with other different types of generation. I mean, it is, there are some that just, it's the way the power plant is set up or the small location that it may be on. But, uh, but as a general matter to the talk, uh, this, the conversation I had with representative Johnson, when, when utilities do that annual triannual biannual look at, is it easier just to keep going and make small investments in what we have or to completely replace it with something something different? Ordinarily, the, the end result of, of that review is it's easier and cheaper to keep what we have open. Yes. Okay. And, and I guess as far as uh, go, going kind of in a different direction, uh, you know, some of the alternative um, sources of generation, they don't uh, provide the same number of jobs. Uh, as uh, traditional fossil. Yeah, that, yeah, and I've talked about this. Oh, I'm sorry. I've talked about this in one of my presentations. It basically goes like this. Uh, nuclear power plant, an, uh, a conventional nuclear power plant, a coal plant, uh, probably one of these new nuclear plants that they're talking about, uh, a natural gas plant, uh, and then probably wind and solar towards the bottom. That's right. Okay. And obviously, the, and I think Representative Johnson hit on this, when the, when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, there's a baseload issue with, renewables is there not yeah they they certainly they uh i think the the term that we've been using we've been talking about stuff with batteries renewables uh is is they have a limited duration and there has to be something there at the end when the that duration stops okay uh i i met with some 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 folks that in, in the co-ops to go back to them and 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 uh we had some discussions do you believe it would be possible to draft legislation that would exclude them from any type of uh securitization uh, provisions uh, given their different operating model so uh, so two answers and i don't mean to be um <laughs> rude anything is possible sure. uh, we should all follow our dreams right uh, i i think it's i think it's certainly possible you know the the whether it's special legislation whatever other concerns i'm sure. not a I, I practice utility law so i can't speak on the other issues but uh i think that i think the reality is that securitization makes sense when you talk about switching out equity returns for debt return and a debt return and equity return and the reality is that, that co-ops don't have equity returns okay and, and do you believe it would also be possible to uh, craft legislation that would uh, have certain protections in there to uh, prevent for-profit uh, utilities uh, or investor-owned utilities from uh, accelerating the decommissioning of their traditional uh, fossil fi uh, fire plants in such a way that, uh, you know, that that would not be a, uh, I guess, decommissioning these assets would not be a factor to be considered when the uh, yeah. PSC approves securitization. Yeah, so can I ask that as a, just to make sure I'm clear what you're asking, that is it possible to write legislation so that the benefits of securitization are not taken into account when determining whether it's economic to retire generation? Exactly. I think yes, I think that would... I think, okay. and and that's to represent. I didn't answer it fairly well, Representative Johnson. But that the the idea is that securitization is something that comes after you've determined what the economic path was. That's what a lot of states have done on, especially with power plants. Is is it economic in isolation to retire this power plant? Okay, that decision has been made. Now let's make it as cheap as possible for customers. Okay, and I think this goes along with something that Chairman Gooch uh, stated. Uh, from the standpoint of maybe do, using this as a, a form to mitigate the impact of um, old debt on something like the Big Sandy uh, power plant with Kentucky yeah. Power, uh, would this be the would that be the ideal situation upon which to use this mechanism? Yeah, and, and again, uh, and artfully uh, answered uh, Representative Johnson's question. I mean, Big Sandy power plant was retired. That decision was made ten years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been on the ground for four or five, six years at this point. 
Uh, it is anticipated to that regulatory asset is being paid off between now and 2040. Um, and how do, I, how do I say this nicely? Um, the financing costs are tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars between now, between when it was created five years ago in 2040. And, and so there's, and there's absolutely no benefit being derived for the rate payer in that funding mechanism, is there? be hard pressed to find I think one. the answer just probably yeah. be no yeah um and finally i guess this was uh, I, I was told by uh, some some representatives that i met with that that uh, they feel within maybe 278 300 uh that that the psc already has the authority to order securitization if they thought it was in the best interest of the ratepayers. do you feel that that's accurate or um so, I know it's difficult for you to speak as, as somebody sitting in judgment, but at the yeah. same time, uh, I'll ask you in, 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 in the most um, hypothetical legal sense. Yeah, so I, you know, I got the benefit. I'm not a judge, right? I don't have to just call balls and strikes. I'm, I'm sure. doing the legislative function that you all passed over to us. So I can, I can like you all do on the floor, occasionally tell my opinion. Um, I, I, okay, let me say it this way. I'd be hard-pressed to find enough support in KRS 278-300 to to require the things that I understand lenders require in order to provide that triple A credit rating on the debt that other states have used in securitization. There are certain promises. I, I don't know that the public, for one of the things that happens in this legislation is that the debt is, the, the lenders have a security interest in the debt. I don't know how we authorize that just using KRS 278-300, which just says we have to approve people's debt. Um, th there's a lot there. This this idea that a, a, a securitization order, once it is approved and the rehearing is up and it, it can never be touched again, I don't I don't know that we can I I don't know that we can do that right right now. The law is that all of our orders are in effect until uh, modified or rejected or appealed and, and overturned, and so that that would be certainly different uh, a different scenario. Clearly, they're looking for certainty. The investors in this debt. That I've, I've, I've come to find out investors love certainty. That's right. <laughs> right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence with my uh, line of questioning. Representative Dotson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just for my own clarity. <clears throat> when you have a decommissioned asset and when it's securitized, that asset is placed on the balance sheet and the utility could also possibly borrow against that just to – no? No, 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 sir. So it is um, – <laughs> And I, I, this is one of those details that I left out. Um, so uh, it, it's it's not. No, I, it, it is it is separate from the utilities. It is not on the utilities books, I guess is the most direct way to say it. Now, at least one of the credit rating agencies right. has a perception and treats it as if it's the utilities debt. But that's just because of the rights of the of the different shareholders. But it is not on the utilities books. Well, with the term asset that. It leads you to believe that. Yeah, yeah. Re know. Regulatory assets are in the books, but once it's securitized, it goes off the books. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Flannery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe Senator Wheeler uh, asked this in his last question, but I'm just not sure if I'm, I just need more clarity on, I guess, your answer. So, is legislation necessary or not necessary as to? the securitization concept that you've presented yeah. today. So I, I again, I struggle to say what, you know, I'll say it this way, that um, the very simple statutory scheme that we have today that says that we have to approve utilities um, debt before they incur it is markedly different and far less complex than the scheme that the other 20 something 27 26 states have created for that require that were required for securitization so i'd be hard-pressed to say something is you know prejudge and say that it you can't do it under the current but i'm I, I think i'd find it hard to believe that somebody would lend the money with the same sort of of protections that other states have granted with what we have to offer them at the same rates and the lower you can the the more certainty you can give those lenders, the lower the cost for the customers is going to be. That's, I think that that would be the, 
whether it's necessary or not, I, I'd hate to pass on, but I would say that if you want the lowest absolute rate, that securitization legislation is probably necessary. Okay, so I guess, I guess your answer is that legislation would be beneficial to the rate payer and with legislation potentially. I, I, again, I don't want to say what is or isn't beneficial to rate payers, but I, I, I personally, I've got some loans and I'd much rather pay 4% than 7% on them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, we are about out of time for questions. Um, a quick question from quick Representative question. Kurt McCormick and then Senator Wheeler, and that's all the questions we're going to be able to allow. Very quickly. Um, I'm going back to the um, retirement of the Big Sandy power plant. The cost, to add insult to injury of, of the war on coal in eastern Kentucky, they put the cost of the decommission of this plant upon the utility payer, the customer's bill. Uh, I, I was shocked when I found out. I, I went to look at that tax, and it was a, a large tax uh, when they first started putting it on there. And when I called to find it out, find out what it was, and when I learned that it was um, the customers were paying the cost of the uh, the demolition of the Kentucky power plant. Uh, and, and I'm hearing that it's going to be, this tax is going to be on their bill until uh, 2040. The, is that correct? Yeah, so, and I, I, it was either 2012 or 2013. There were two cases back to back. But um, in those cases, the decommissioning rider was approved through the what would have otherwise been the remaining life of the asset, which was 2040. Yep. Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty uh, pretty slap in the face to the people of Eastern Kentucky to uh, shut the plant down to start with, but secondly, to make them pay for the demolition of the plant. So yeah, thank and there's, you. there's much, it's, it gets it's worse. It gets worse than that. The yeah. I think the the school district in the county that it was located in um, received I think close to a million dollars a year in annual um, taxes from the facility that went to effectively zero yeah. once it's retired. Yeah. So, thank you. Senator Wheeler. Uh, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Kent, if, if, if we were to pass a securitization bill that gave you the authority necessary to, uh, to uh, securitize these um, uh, decommissioning costs like the Big Sandy Power Plant, uh, what type of uh, savings could you see for the right payers of Eastern Kentucky <laughs> with that kind of mechanism Real, realizing that interest rates have gone up some but uh yeah what what would you think that uh, how this would impact their bills in a realistic sense yeah so i i, I hate that i don't have the numbers in front of me and I, I i i wish i would have thought to bring, bring the numbers back of the napkin kind of thing uh but realistically let's just say you securitize the big sandy retirement rider next year uh, assuming interest rates don't rise any more than what, which is a crazy assumption, they're going to raise uh, rise more. They went up another 75 basis point yesterday. Um, I mean, we're talking a, a magnitude of it would save annually millions of dollars a year for Kentucky Power ratepayers. I'd say it. Um, I'd venture to say it would be close to seven, nine, ten million dollars a year per year each year for the next uh, 18 years, 17 years. That's just a. That's a. I'm sort of doing the middle math on that, but I would. Sure. I, mil, I'm not holding you to it. I'm just millions saying. and millions of dollars. Like it, it's not a hundred thousand dollars a year savings in interest or anything like that. It's it's millions and millions of dollars. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, that's the reason we were kind of looking at this topic. And so, Kent, go ahead. Uh, you have. Uh, yeah, and I, I just just real quick because I I boy, do we know? Uh, we, we see bills. We see our own bills. We see the. We get calls from folks. Um, uh, one of the things that, that Senator Smith was kind of asking about, look, we're the retail rate regulator. The majority of the costs that we let utilities incur, we don't have any control over, and the utility in large part doesn't have any control over, right? We're just the suckers that get stuck at the end having to say what rates ought to be. Um, so I just want to talk a minute. The, you all know what's happening globally, nationally, all these different issues, and, and how it ends up in different bills is, uh, is, is, is important. So just a couple of things, and, and all of these are, are implicated by the, the volatility. Uh, the first, I'm just going to talk about two of them primarily, the first and the third thing here, the fuel adjustment clause that electric utilities have in the state and the gas cost adjustments that our gas utilities have. 
Uh, the fuel adjustment clause has been, as a regulation, has been in effect for 40 years. But the fuel adjustment clause is a 60 or 70 year old uh, um, uh, mechanism, I guess I'd call it. Uh, and it, it literally is a line item on utilities bills where they pass through to customers the incremental or decremental amount of fuel or purchase power costs that they incurred in the last couple of months. Um, fuel costs make up a significant portion, as you can imagine, of utilities bills. And just to give you a, an idea of the magnitude, Kentucky Utilities, who's the largest utility in the state, they had $1.64 billion in sales uh, in 2021. About a third of that is reflective of just the amount of fuel, just the cost of fuel that they had to, uh, to buy uh, in order to generate that power. And 2021 was not terrible for fuel costs, not like 2022, certainly. Uh, there was about a 10 or 12 year period where fuel costs were pretty stagnant. Um, where that's not us, that's not happening anymore. So, um, how it works, it's a, just a set amount based on a baseline. Uh, we require utilities to fully, fully document all their fuel costs. Uh, we allow utilities to pass through the costs that they've recently incurred and all of it at the end is subject to review at six month and two year periods. So we don't review the costs at the time the utility passes it through to customers. Uh, if they did something wrong or they should have done something differently, uh, we make them uh, give that cost back to customers uh, in one of those review periods, either the six month or two year review periods. But nothing they do in the FAC uh, effectively evades our um, uh, evades our review to ensure that something wasn't improper or that something wasn't calculated appropriately. Gas cost adjustments are very similar for gas utilities. These are not in regulation. Instead, they're in the tariff. Uh, these are kind of in the tariffs the same way that the fuel adjustment clause was before we put it in regulation all those years ago. Uh, utilities, gas utilities come in and file these, uh, these updates on a prospective basis for the next quarter. They include new gas cost and over or under recovery of whatever their gas cost adjustment was the last period, the difference between what they expected gas to cost, what it ended up actually costing, and then a provision for balancing for the remainder of it. So I just wanted to give you all an example. Uh, and I only picked these utilities. These are, I guess I picked them randomly, alphabetically. They're the <laughs> they were the first two for electric and for gas. Uh, so for Atmos, uh, just to give you a magnitude of the cost that they're incurring in order to procure fuel for customers, the gas cost recovery, this is in addition to base rates, the customer charge, and everything else. This is just for the commodity of gas. In October of 2020, they were charging customers $3.91 per MCF. Average customer uses five or six MCF a month. In October of 2022, that amount is $9.58, two and a half times, almost three times more. Uh, for uh, for FAC, now the FAC is a lot more volatile. It can go from a positive to a, ne a negative in a single month. There are a lot more characteristics, so I don't want to uh, really scare anybody by, by this, but uh, October 2020, it was actually a, pos a negative number. They were giving customers a credit in the FAC that month. Uh, in October of 2022, it is $0.04 cents, uh, kilowatt hour average. Kentucky Power customer uses... 1,160, almost 1,200 kilowatt hours a month. Uh, and so this, again, is just about passing through a commodity cost to customers. This has nothing to do with investments, infrastructure, labor, nothing. Uh, this is all in addition to the customer charge and everything else. Uh, it just as easily could be a negative number again next month, but I just wanted to give you all a, an idea of, of what those volatilities are. Um, and then just real quick, uh, fuel issues. Everybody knows the natural gas prices are going up. The result of that is that natural gas units are being operated less because they're more expensive. So then coal started getting dispatched more often. And again, going back to that supply and demand, uh, the demand for coal went up, therefore, uh, and the supply stayed about the same. And so coal prices at some point last year were up three or three and a half times what they used to be. Um, so um, all of that gets gets reflected. Uh, the, the reality is at least the majority of our utilities have long-term coal contracts at set rates or fairly set rates, uh, three, four, five, six, seven-year contracts. And so they do see, some of our utilities see less volatility than others uh, in terms of uh, the cost of the fuel that they've been incurring. So um, uh, I, just uh, going back, you know, here's here's where generation options are. Uh, everything has a trade-off. Uh, it is not an apples to apples situation. Uh, I think a lot of people are putting their apples in the basket of new nuclear. Uh, it's safer, it's cheaper, it's smaller, um, uh, but uh, it's also 
12 to 15 years away at best. Uh, and there's a lot of time between a lot of, a lot of water will be under the bridge in the next 12 to 15 years. So, uh, and then this is just our most recent, uh, current electricity generation profile. Um, almost 70% still coal, about a quarter of our generation is natural gas. And then that hydro is, uh, staying pretty, uh, it used to be about 5%. Now it's up to 7%. There've been some, um, changes on the Kentucky river. They've put some locks in to create, uh, more, uh, hydroelectricity along the Kentucky river. And that's been, uh, increasing that number over time. Uh, as always, I just want to say um, I probably bother uh, Senator Wheeler, Representative Gooch, quite a bit uh, <laughs> talking to him about these things, talking about these things. But um, you know, we're carrying out the right making function. That's a uh, it's a legislative function, right? We're doing. You all deferred to us on doing that. And uh, anytime you all have questions, anytime you have concerns, you want to know about something, feel free to give us a call or let us know, or send us an email, or have staff reach out to us. We're always happy to help. Thank you, Kent. That certainly uh, I thought was a very good presentation, and I learned a lot. And uh, that you know, when I can come to one of these meetings, I've been on this chairman of this committee for about 24 years, and and when I come and am able to learn something, I always in, enjoy that. Uh, and and you certainly did a good job, and we appreciate the work that you do. Um, let let me just say that uh, you know you mentioned that a lot of our utilities that are that that use coal in Kentucky have had some long-term contracts, and it's really good that they have because I think last committee there was testimony from uh, some people at the cabinet that uh, the average coal price in Kentucky was about $138 a ton. Uh, they're able to get much more than that, probably around $200 a ton, uh, especially in the export market and other places that don't have uh, long-term contracts. And so um, hopefully for the remainder of, of this year, um, those coal contracts will keep our, you know, where they're not having this, a large fuel adjustment clauses because of coal. But I can tell you that everyone out there is, for the last few months, have been focusing on the price of gasoline. And, and we have actually seen some gasoline that come down a little bit for a while. It's going back up. But, you know, people focus on that, and they're not focusing on you know, diesel is not down, propane is not down, home heating oil is not down. And, and I can tell you that uh, to the people that are going to be on this committee next year, uh, once our citizens go through this winter with the uh, fuel adjustment clauses and things that they're going to see, uh, utilities is going to be a much bigger issue uh, when we come back in January, in my opinion, it's strictly my opinion. But uh, thanks uh, to the committee members. I hope we got most of your questions answered. And uh, with that, we stand adjourned.